So, today and this week, we're going to be starting with the speaking section, actually, now that we're done with the listening. Um, so, let's see, let's take a look at the speaking section. Please don't forget your cameras. Okay, guys. So, the speaking section, as you probably know, is the third section of the test. It's over 30, just like the other sections. And, well, it's the only section that has remained unchanged. That means that no matter when you take the test, it'll always be the same. Okay, it's always the same. It lasts 20 minutes, approximately. Uh, so it's the shortest section in terms of time, okay? But let's take a look. So here's an overview of the speaking section. As you guys can see, we have a total of four different questions in the speaking section. We have question one, question two, question three, question four. We're gonna call them tasks as well. So if I ever say task one, task two, task three, then you know that what I mean is question one, question two, question three. Okay, guys. And as you can also see, we have both independent questions, well, one independent question in the speaking section, and we actually have three integrated questions. So does anyone by any chance know what it means when a question is integrated or independent? Do you guys, do you guys know? Uh, well, the independent is about a topic that you know, and the integrated, uh, in those questions, you need to listen or to read other lectures or information. Exactly. Perfect. Thank you, Christian. So yes, exactly as Christian is saying. In the independent questions in general, and this is the same we are going to see for the writing section, what you have to do is just talk about yourself, give your opinion. You don't have to read or listen to anything but the question. You have the question and then you answer it right off. And it's just about yourself. It's about your opinion on something. However, for the integrated questions, as said, you guys will have to either read something or listen to something or both, right? In, in some questions, you'll have to read and listen to something. And then you have to summarize that, summarize the content that you read or that you heard. So for the integrated questions, they're called like that because you're supposed to integrate different skills. So it's not just about speaking, but it's about your reading comprehension, your listening comprehension as well. That's why they are called integrated because you get to integrate different skills. So the independent is about yourself. You just talk about your opinion, but the integrated ones require you to summarize something. So it's more objective. You are not allowed to give your opinions in the integrated ones, but you just have to focus on summarizing the content that they give. Okay, guys. So, um, is that okay so far? Do you guys have any questions about this? No questions? Okay, then let's see. Today and this week, we're going to be working only on question one, all right? That is the independent question of the writing section. But before we start working on the independent question, I want to talk about the way that they score this section. That is really important for you guys to know. Remember that for the reading and listening sections, it's black and white, right? You either answer one question correctly or you answer it wrong, right? It's either right or wrong. 
nowhere to get lost in the reading and listening sections. But what happens here in the speaking section? Basically, what you guys will have to do is you will get the questions. They will ask you to give your opinion or to summarize something, and they will record your response. They will record what you say. You have to speak for a certain amount of time, and they will be recording your response. Now, how will they score your response? How will they grade you? Based on certain criteria, based on certain uh, rubrics that they have. It's not like you could ever have a wrong answer, right? There's no such thing as having a wrong or right answer in this case, but they are gonna evaluate your responses based on certain criteria. So let's take a look at that criteria. First thing that I wanna say is you can find it online. If you search for TOEFL speaking uh, rubrics, If you look this up, then the first thing that pops up, that's exactly it. Okay, this is published by the ETS. It's available, I'm gonna send you guys the link. And basically in this PDF, they are summarizing the things that they want from your response. They are summarizing the things they're gonna be looking at and analyzing and scoring when you submit your response. So you have one for the independent speaking, the question one, and another one for the integrated questions. Now, uh, as you can see, they want to score your response from zero to 30, right? It's not like it's going to be, as you may imagine, from zero to 30. But instead, they will grade your response from zero to four, on a scale from zero to four. And it's kind of like levels, level four response, level three response, level two, level one, level zero. Now, according to the level that you get, you will they will weigh your, your scores and they will assign you one specific score. So for example, if you are a level four response, that means that your score, your actual score could be between 25 to 30, right? If you are a level three response, it's, it's gonna be from 20 to 25. So it's not like they, they start by scoring you from zero to 30. Okay, guys. And as you guys can see here, they have a description of what you need to get each score, to get a four, to get a three, to get a two. And they have organized it in three different categories, which are delivery, language use, and topic development. So let's see, let's talk about them. We're gonna see. Okay, so Elizabeth, please, can you read what we have, the three points that we have for topic development? Okay, uh, task for moment, uh, current conscience time, uh, support and development, details and examples, uh, justification, uh, connection and structure, uh, and connector progression of ideas. Okay, thank you, Lisa. So, as you can see, the topic development category basically has to do with the content of your response. It's related to what you say in your response. The first thing that says task fulfillment has to, I mean, has to do with whether you're answering the question, whether you're following the instructions or not. So, the instructions ask you to do something, right? If they ask a question about whether you like running or, or walking, and your response is actually answering the question, you're actually saying what you like, and it is coherent, it makes sense, it's concise, which means that you're not saying like thousands of words without actually proving any points. And if you're using the time that they give you properly, so if they give you 45 seconds to speak, if you're using those 45 seconds well, then that means that you're fulfilling the task. You're, you're following the instructions, right? You're doing what they're asking to. So in order to get a, a good score in this part, your response needs to make sense. It needs to be coherent. It needs to be concise so you cannot be redundant. And you need to use the time that they give you properly. Okay, guys? Now, support and development is related to the depth that your response has. Specifically in task number one, as, as you know, they're gonna ask for your opinion on something, right? 
Like maybe they say, do you prefer to run or to walk? So what you need to do is give your opinion on what you prefer. But it's not just enough with giving your opinion. You need to actually support your opinion, develop your opinion, elaborate on that idea. You cannot just leave it superficial. It has to have some depth. So in order to support your opinion, you need to give reasons, you need to give details, explanations, justifications. You need to develop that idea, not just leave it there. So it has to have some certain depth, okay? And finally, they want something that's well-structured. So your response needs to have like an introduction, a body. It has to have connectors and transitions that are appropriate, that connect ideas. The ideas need to progress and flow easily. You're not gonna change off topic like that and then talk about something else, right? You're supposed to have some sort of progression in your ideas. And that's basically topic development, which is related, as I said, to the content of your response. Is that okay so far? Any questions? Okay, guys. So, uh, Tamara, please, can you read the second part, the two points that we have for delivery? Of course, delivery, pronunciation and intonation, stress articulation intelligibly, volume and speech, fluidity, pauses, filler word, words. Okay, thanks, Tamara. So delivery, as you may guess, is how you deliver, how you speak, how you deliver your response, right? How you, how your speech is, how you speak, how well you can speak. Uh, so in delivery, we have two different things. The first one has to do with pronunciation and intonation. Pronunciation, I think it's self-explanatory, but I, what I wanna clarify is that it's totally fine if you guys have an accent, okay? The purpose here is not to like eliminate any accents because remember that the English language is such a, like a huge language that, that has so many accents, right? There are so many people who have learned and speak the language as native speakers. So, the goal here is not to sound like a native speaker. It's totally okay if, if they tell that you're not native speakers because you're not, right? So it's totally okay. But what I mean with pronunciation is pronouncing the words in a way that they are easily understood by the listener, right? So you just have to have a correct pronunciation, even if you have an accent. For example, if I have the word uh, justification, right? And instead of pronouncing it like that, I say justificación, right? And is the listener going to understand what I'm saying? Probably not, right? Uh, so that's the thing. You need to pronounce the words in a way that they are easily understood. Not only that, but intonation plays an important role as well. And you have no idea how many students I've seen that have like almost perfect responses, but, but for some reason cannot just intonate. What do I mean by intonate? your response cannot be linear, right? Because um, they're, they're gonna get lost. So when, when somebody speaks, I don't know if you guys noticed, but you change the tone of your voice, right? According to what you're saying. You stress certain parts. When you wanna put emphasis on something that is important, you stress that word in the, in the sentence, right? Uh, for example, with the negative sentences, you tend to stress the negative. And you're like, please do not do this, right? So you're do not, you're stressing the word not. So it's important that you guys intonate the, the, your, your response. It's not supposed to be something linear, like you're reading something boring, but try to think like you're really passionate about the topic, you're enthusiastic about it. So you need to try to speak in a way that shows that, uh, that enthusiasm. That usually helps a lot with intonation, okay? So articulating the words correctly is also important because your response needs to be intelligible. What does that mean? It needs to be the listener, the person who's listening to your response needs to put no effort into understanding what you're saying. If the listener is having problems in understanding what you're saying, then that could affect your score, right? It has to be something very, very understandable, very easily understood. okay? And finally, flow and speech has to do, they have to do with how fluent you are. So like if you are making too many pauses to think, maybe that means that you're not too fluent yet, right? Uh, if you're making too, if you're using too many filler words, 
for example, some students tend to use this a eh, a lot, right, when thinking. So they're like, flow a eh, in speech a eh, when I was a. Eh. So that's okay, you know, we've, I mean, we all have something that we say, it's normal. But if you feel that that's affecting, I mean, your fluency, if that's interrupting your response too much, then you need to try to work on that and get rid of that, of the filler word that you're using. If you're using filler words in Spanish, the same thing. If you're making too many pauses, then again, you know, you maybe you need to try to like uh, reduce the pauses that you're making. So that's basically delivery. How you speak, how you deliver your response, pronunciation and intonation, and how fluent you are. Hey guys, is that okay so far? Any questions? Right. And finally, we have language use. So, Micaela, can you please read the two points we have, two bullet points? Um, okay. Uh, vocabulary usage, uh, appropriacy and range, grammar, correct grammar usage, and grammar variety. Thank you. So, language use is related to the tools that you use to speak. So this includes vocabulary and grammar. Now, when I say vocabulary, of course that it is important to have somehow uh, a wide range of vocabulary. But when I say that, I don't mean that you need to like memorize some fancy words, complex words, unknown words that nobody has heard of and try to force yourself to use them in your response. Okay, so try to avoid making that mistake. I've seen students who like memorize a couple of fancy words and try to use them to improve vocabulary, but that's not the way to go. Um, my suggestion is instead of focusing on using too many different words or too many complex words, try to focus on using the appropriate words. So what do I mean by appropriate words? Appropriate to the context. For example, if you guys are talking about relationships, if the question has to do with or is related to relationships, uh, instead of saying, so that day my boyfriend and I, we ended our relationship. So the correct or the, the most appropriate vocabulary to use would be to say something like, we split up, right? Maybe, or we broke up. So that's what I mean with appropriacy, right? It has to be uh, appropriate to the context of, of the topic of the, of the question, right? If you're talking about business, you cannot say people, you're supposed to say customers, right? If you're talking about education, try not to say like being present in class. You have to say attending class, right? So that's what I mean with appropriate vocabulary. And when I say, well, when we talk about grammar, it's the same. Of course that you need to be careful not to make too many grammar mistakes, but to be honest, don't stress out it's fine if you guys make some grammar mistakes, as long as you guys are not showing that you have a problem with one specific point in grammar. So for example, if throughout your response, you're constantly making the same mistake of using gerunds or not using gerunds when you have to, they are gonna see that you have a problem with gerunds and that will lower your score. So my suggestion is know yourself, of course, you guys are gonna practice. You're gonna practice with me as well. So I will tell you what specific grammar points you are you need to work on. But especially if you guys will take the test soon, once that you have identified what grammar points you have problems with, let's say you're really bad at conjugating the verb tenses in the past, try to avoid doing that. Try to avoid using past tenses. So try to do something else, right? If you're bad with conditional sentences, then don't use that. So try to try not to use the, the grammar points that you don't feel comfortable using. And finally, same thing as vocabulary, you need to show grammar variety, which means using more than just one grammar structure, right? Not using too many simple sentences, uh, simple structures. Because if you wanna have like a C1, C2 score, then you need to show the, the grammar for a C1, C2 student, right? So what do I mean by that? If you just have simple sentences, let's say, I like pizza, I don't like sushi, right? 
That's too simple. The grammar is too simple there. But if you use a compound sentence and you, you say, even though I don't like sushi, I actually like pizza, then now you have a compound sentence, right? So it, it shows more grammar variety. So using conditional sentences, using compound sentences, um, like using different verb tenses, the passive voice, all those things like count and they will definitely have an effect on your score. But if you have to force yourself to do it, or if you're not confident with those grammar structures, then it's better to avoid. Okay, same thing as vocabulary. Avoid the grammar that you're not comfortable with. Avoid the vocabulary that you don't know how to use. Okay, guys? So that's it. Topic development, the content, delivery, how you speak, and language use, which is basically vocabulary and grammar. Is that okay? Do you guys have any questions so far? No questions? Okay, guys, great. Then that's it. As I was telling you, we're gonna see question one today of the speaking section. So remember that it's called the independent question, right? Because you have to give your opinion. So what we're gonna do is, I'm gonna show you guys with an example, what it is exactly that you have to do, how the question will be like, um, what you will see on your screen, the instructions. So let's watch this video. And then we will be seeing what exactly you have to do. Okay. Let's see. Number one. In this question, you will be asked to give your opinion about a familiar topic. After you hear the question, you will have 15 seconds to prepare your response and 45 seconds to speak. State whether you agree or disagree with the following statement. Then explain your reasons using specific details in your explanation. Learning through online courses is more effective than learning in the traditional classroom setting. Begin to prepare your response after the beep. Begin speaking after the beep. Okay, guys. So that's it. Um, as you guys can see, first you get the instructions, and the instructions uh, basically tell you what you have to do. And what you have to do is pretty simple. You first get the question on your screen. As you can see here on the top of your screen, you will have the question, and they will read them. They will read it for you guys, but you can also read them on your own, right? You don't necessarily have to be paying attention to what the narrator says. You can, if you feel that you focus better by reading by yourself, then you can do that. And then you get 15 seconds to prepare your response. So you are gonna hear the narrator tell you, uh, begin preparing your response after the beep. And you hear a beep, right? Beep, and then the time starts counting down, right? So 15, 14, 13, as you saw in the, in the previous step. You have this preparation time, as you know, to prepare your response. And you can do whatever you want during this preparation time. They won't be recording what you do, so it won't count for your score. It's not a scored part. And then after the 15 seconds are over, then you need to start speaking already because they will start recording what you're saying. So they will tell you, begin speaking after the beep, and you will hear another beep, and you have to start speaking already, right? So 
uh, that's it. What else do I have to say? You have the timer, as you can see. So you can see how much time you have left in each part. You have the question too. It won't go away. It won't disappear. And that's it. After the 45 seconds are over, they will stop recording. So you have to stop speaking. They won't count anything else that you say after the time. So is this okay, guys? Do you have any questions as for the format of this question? Is it all clear? No questions? Okay, guys, great. Then let's see what you actually have to do. But in order to see what we have to do, we have to analyze the question first. So, um, Carolina, please, can you read the question one more time? Okay. Um, learning through online courses is more effective than learning in the traditional classroom setting. Okay, thank you. And the question is, state whether you agree or disagree with that. Right, that's the, that, those are the instructions. So as you guys can see, what you're gonna do for this question is say, if you agree, that means if you think the same way or if you disagree, right? If you think that that's wrong with the statement that you have uh, at the bottom, learning through online courses is more effective than learning in the traditional way. So um, what are we gonna do? How many options do you have to answer this question? How many possible answers do you have in this case? Mm, two possible answers. Exactly, which are? And that uh, if you agree or you disagree. Exactly, great. So you just have two possible answers. You can, you can either say that you agree with the statement, you think that online courses are more effective, or you could say that you disagree with it and that online courses are not more effective. But there's no third choice. Those are the only two possible options you have to answer the question. You cannot say that it depends. You can say that both have their advantages and disadvantages. You're not supposed to do an evaluation of the pros and cons of each or anything like that. You have to say that you agree or you disagree completely with it. That's gonna be my first tip. Please never waver between the options. Never be like, I think in some cases, this one is better, in the other one, the other one. So you have to go right off with one of the, one of the choices. Now, this is not the only question type though, there are more. So this, that one is called agree and disagree type, but it's not the only one. So for example, let's see. Okay. Okay, these are the other types. So the agree and disagree type is the one that we just saw, right? Do you agree or disagree with this statement? But we also have the preference type. So maybe, uh, Christian, can you please read this question here? Mm, yes. Um, do you prefer taking online courses or traditional face to face classes? Okay, good. So, um, what? how many options do we have for the second type of question? Uh, the same two options. Exactly. And the options are the same as well, right? We can either say that we prefer online courses or traditional courses. So even though it's phrased differently than the first, at the end of the day, it's exactly the same. You have two different choices. You could say that you prefer online courses or that you prefer traditional courses. You can say that you're okay with both, that, you, that it depends. You need to go for one of the options always. And we also have the good idea type. So maybe Elizabeth, could you read the question we have? Last one. Uh, 
<clears throat> and some universities are no and some universities are now offering full online programs and eliminating the option of having traditional classes. Do you think it's a good idea that the students take only classes instead of continuing with traditional education? Okay, thanks, Elizabeth. So, how many options do we have in this third time? Two, right? We could say that we think that it is a good idea, or we could say that we don't think that it's a good idea, right? Do we think that it's a good idea that students take online courses instead of traditional ones, or we don't think that it's a good idea? So, as you guys can see, no matter which type of question you get, the the question is the same, right? They, they give you two options, and you need to choose one of the options. So, any questions so far? Okay, guys, so give me a second, please. I'm plugging my computer because it's running out of battery. Okay, guys. So let's work on this question then. What do you have to do during the preparation and response time? Remember that first you get 15 seconds to prepare. So during this time, what we are gonna do is we will uh think we will only think because 15 seconds are not that much so you honestly won't have time to do a lot what are we going to think about we're going to think about what we're going to say what our answer to the question is so we're going to choose one of the options in this case what do you guys think do we say that we agree that online courses are more effective or do we say that we disagree what would you guys say Do we agree or disagree? Anyone? Come on, guys. It doesn't have to reflect your actual opinion, right? It does not have to be true at all. It just has to be the, the easiest option that you that you feel, the one that you feel is the easiest option, right? So what do we choose? Do we say that we agree or do we disagree with it? Mm, disagree. Disagree. Okay, good. So we disagree. We we think that online courses are not more effective. Now, aside from thinking of your opinion, you actually have to also think of at least one reason why you feel that way, or one reason why anybody would feel that way, right? It doesn't have to be your true opinion. So why do we disagree? Can you guys think of one reason why online courses are not more effective? Uh, because, uh, for example, practical courses or laboratory subjects are really difficult to uh, to offer. Okay. To develop. I like that actually. I really do. Um, so yes, I like that it's very different. But one thing that I wanted to say here, when you guys are thinking of your reasons, uh, I want to say that what you say in terms of what reason you give is not really going to influence much your response, your score, sorry. So that means that you could go with a simple reason. Let's say uh, I disagree because, um, I don't know, you can concentrate with online courses. So that's something very simple, very obvious, perhaps doesn't require too much thought. Uh, but it's okay if you go with that with that with that reason, right? And it's the same if you go with a more complex reason. Let's say that we think of something more more complicated. Maybe we'd say that we disagree that they are more effective because um, 
I don't know. We say something like, because like universities, I don't know. I don't know. If we think of a more complex reason, let's say, it won't affect really. It won't have, there won't be a difference between uh, in your score. Because at the end of the day, what matters most than what you say, what your reason is, or whether you agree or disagree, is the way that you say it, right? The way, or if you can explain it or not. So keep that in mind uh, in order to avoid complicating yourself. In this case, it's good. I'd say it's a, it's a really good reason to use. So let's leave it there. We disagree because with laboratory classes or with practical classes, then they are hard to, to offer. And that's it. That's all you are gonna be able to do probably during those 15 seconds. If you can do more, that means that if you can think of another reason, that would be great to have it just in case. But if you can make it on time to think of one more reason, that's okay as well. You don't actually need more than one reason, but it's good to have it just in case, you know? So if you can do it, then go for it. And if you can't, no problem. So in this case, let's think of one more reason. What can be another reason why online courses are not more effective? Yeah, I have one that I consider a virtual classes or virtual session. You can get distracted easily. Okay, all right, good. So it's what, what I was saying, right? Related to concentration. With online courses, you can get distracted really easily. Perfect, great. When you're thinking of reasons and if you have more than one, one thing that I wanna make sure I say is that take, I mean, be really careful. Your two reasons need to be completely different from one another. That means that they don't have to be related at all. So if you have one, let's say that your first reason is that you can concentrate more with traditional courses. And the second is that there are many things that could distract you at home when you take online courses, then it's kind of the same, right? So if you go for the two of them, you're gonna be redundant. You're just gonna repeat the same idea. So if you guys are gonna give more than one reason, they need to be completely different uh, and unrelated because otherwise you will just be redundant. Okay, so that's one more thing. Any questions so far? Remember, this is what you do when you're prepared during those 15 seconds. I really suggest that you guys take a few notes. So you write down a few of the keywords so that you do, don't forget and you keep your focus when you're speaking. But that's it. Any questions now? Is it all okay up until this point? Um, is it necessary to give uh, examples? Yes, it is. Uh, after the reason, right? Or, yes. Um, Any other questions so far? Okay, guys. Now, after your 15 seconds to prepare are over, then you need to start speaking. Remember that you'll have 45 seconds to answer the question. So what you guys have to do is first, during the first seven to eight seconds, I really don't suggest that you go over this number. Seven to eight seconds is the maximum that you can spend here in the first part. And here you're supposed to have a short, brief introduction. An introduction where you basically will answer the question as directly as you can. So the question was, do you agree or disagree? So my suggestion, when you're answering the question in your introduction, use the same verb. If the question is agree or disagree, then say, I agree or I disagree. If you have the other questions, like do you prefer this or that? Use the same verb. I prefer this, I prefer that. If you have good idea, do you think it's a good idea? Then use the same verb. I think it's a good idea, or I don't think it's a good idea. So always, use the same verbs, okay? That's gonna be my tip. Um, now, another thing that you have to use before using the verb is to use an adverb as well. And this adverb is gonna help make your response even stronger. 
there are many options for adverbs that you guys can use. You could say, I strongly agree, I strongly disagree, I absolutely agree, I totally disagree, I certainly disagree, I completely disagree. Many adverbs that you guys can use. You have an example here of the one strongly. Um, so you could use whichever one you want, okay? But maybe you, you can just leave it like this and use a strong. And then another suggestion that I can give you guys is don't just say, I disagree and leave it there. Try to repeat the state. Remember that when you're speaking, what you have on your screen is the question and the time. So you can use the question for your introduction. Repeat the statement that you have in the question. In this case, we would say, I strongly disagree that online courses are more effective. And that's it, that's enough. I don't have to repeat everything, right? I strongly disagree that learning through online courses is more effective than learning in the traditional classroom setting. I do not have to repeat everything. You could summarize it if you want, you could paraphrase it, no problem, but try to, re try to say the statement, right? The idea. So in this case, our introduction is gonna be, I strongly disagree that online courses are more effective. And that's it. We are directly answering the question using the same verb, using an adverb, and repeating the same. Is that okay so far? Any questions about that? No questions? Good. Then, now that you've had your introduction, you need to state your reason. So remember this was seven to eight seconds. That means that if you started with 45, you should have 38, 37 seconds left when you finish your introduction. And that's when you guys have to start talking about your reason. So my suggestion for your reason will be keep it short. Try not to over explain it. Problem that most students have is they try to explain it too much, too, like give like too many explanations for the reason, when sometimes it's not even necessary because the reason is self-explanatory. You don't have to really explain it. You know, it's something that, uh, that doesn't need an explanation. So my suggestion is keep it short again. I would say that the ideal time to spend here would be to, from 10 to even 20 seconds if it really needs an explanation, but that's it, no more than that. So that means that you should have 30 seconds, I'm sorry, you should have 28 to 18 seconds left after you're done with your reason. Um, and that's it, right? That's your reason, you're good to go. Now, finally, as Christian was asking, remember that the instruction said that you need to give reasons and details. So how do we give details? By giving examples. We need to show evidence of what we're saying. If we're saying that, uh, with laboratory classes or with practical classes, students don't learn when they have online courses, then you need to provide details. You need to provide evidence. So maybe with the examples, you can go with a general example. So for example, you could say, so for example, this happens especially for science majors. Uh, maybe you could mention one specific major. Maybe you could say, uh, let's say, I don't know, like physics majors need to have laboratory and practical classes in order to learn their lessons, uh, I don't know, in depth. However, with online courses, this is not possible due to the lack of, I don't know, the lack of equipment from students. So you start explaining. But the important thing is that you give details, right? You're talking specifically about one thing. You're talking about physics majors. Uh, or you could talk about another science, I don't know. You could talk about university specifically, or you could talk about high school. But you need to give those details. You need to make sure that you're not talking about something in general terms, but instead of mentioning a specific example. Or you could also talk about a personal experience and you could say, for example, I remember that two years ago, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, I was in university and I was taking most of my science classes then. I remember that I took this physics class where we needed to do laboratories in order to learn 
uh, most of the lessons. However, since we were taking online courses, this wasn't possible. And I felt that I didn't learn as much as I could have if I had taken face-to-face -face classes, right? Or if I had had my practical classes. So that's it. That's a personal experience. Same thing here. I am talking about one specific class. I'm giving details. I could even go farther and talk one, about one specific lesson, right? I could say, I remember this lesson we were learning about this thing. So the important thing is that you give details. It could be a journal example or a personal experience, but it needs to contain details. Okay, guys, and that's the rest of your response. That's all you guys need. Your introduction, where you directly answer the question, your reason, your a short reason, and your example with appropriate details. Is that okay so far? Do you guys have any questions so far? No questions? Okay, guys. Now, this is different for every student. You know, like personally, to tell you my experience, when I, when I took the test, I only gave one reason because I usually elaborate too much on the examples and I make sure that I give details. So for me, one reason was enough. I made it on time. I didn't have extra time and I didn't run out of time. It was okay. And for most students, I would say that's the case because 45 seconds is not a lot. So one reason, one example is perfect, but there are also some other students who usually finish faster. So they maybe speak faster, I don't know, or they just have shorter examples, but they have a lot of extra time. So in case you're done with your reason in your example, and if you still have more time, let's say you have 15, 20 seconds, then you can go with another reason. And this is the second reason that you have just in case. So you can talk about that. So you could say furthermore, another benefit of having on, or another disadvantage of online courses is that students get easily distracted with them, right? And therefore they don't learn as much. So that could be your second reason. The only thing that I would say is that remember that it has to be different from the first. And you don't need to have another example. One example is more than enough. You probably won't have time for two examples. Okay, guys. And if you have extra time, but it's not that much, let's say that you have five, seven seconds, you can just go with a conclusion. And you can say, this is the main reason why I don't agree that online courses are more effective or this is why I feel this way. This is why I think, depending on how much time you have, right? But remember that the second reason and the conclusion are completely optional, right? You don't need to necessarily have. So is that okay now? Any questions? Okay, guys, good. Then what we're gonna do now before we go is I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna give you guys a sample response so that you can see how I manage my time, the things that I say, the things that I don't say, how I say it. And since you guys already know how these, these responses are scored, you can also try to analyze how I'm doing it, right? You can try to score my response based on what we talked about, right? Pronunciation, intonation, the content, the time, the connectors, um, if I have enough details, the grammar, the vocabulary, you can look at those things. So let's see, here's a timer. I'm gonna set it for 45 seconds and let's go. I strongly disagree that taking online courses is more effective since with online courses, most students are not able to properly uh, focus on the class. For instance, during the COVID-19 pandemic, I was still in university and my university wasn't offering, unfortunately, any, any 
face-to-face -face classes. I was forced to take most of my classes online. I remember this biology class that I took specifically that I ended up failing due to the fact that when I had the class, I got distracted with the things that I had at home. My family members would always interrupt my classes or I would get distracted with my phone or the TV, right? So that's an example. It wasn't perfect probably. Honestly, I wanted to say more in the example, but I stopped myself and I tried to make, make it look like at least I'm finishing, right? Even though I honestly wasn't done yet, I wanted to continue. But the important thing is that you try to hide that and make, it, and make sure that you close the idea before the time is over. Running out of time is never an option, you guys. And as you can see, I mm -hmm. hurry up in the introduction and in the reason, I try to speak even as lower than I normally speak because that way you can articulate the words better, that way you avoid making many mistakes. Um, I try to I, I try to use some connectors, right? Like unfortunately, however, uh, aside from the ones that we have here, and I just had one reason and one example, right? No conclusion was needed, no second reason was either needed. And it was simple, right? It was very simple ideas, nothing too complicated, just simple. And I did something like that when I took the test and it went well. So you really don't need anything very complex. So is this okay now? Do you have any questions now that you've heard my response to? Okay, guys. So tomorrow it's our practice session. So we will be practicing. You guys will be practicing. I'll be giving you some feedback, but we'll also be listening to some other sample responses from other people who have scored. Or I don't, they haven't scored a five level, but they are sample responses from those levels, right? So we're going to be listening to those. We'll be talking about the topics of the questions, which is really important to know. And that's it. There's not much that we can do. We're, we're mostly going to practice. And we will see the other question types as well, because this is just agree or disagree. I'll be giving you guys some tips on the other ones. So no questions, really. Is everything clear? No comments, questions? Okay, guys. So please, before you go, don't forget today's daily survey. It should be on your screens. And I will see you guys tomorrow in class in our practice session. Okay, thank you guys. Thanks, bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.